If you enjoy Jerusalem Unplugged, you may also like to listen to Stories from Palestine podcast. My name is Crystal. I am originally from the Netherlands. I am married to a Palestinian and I live in Beit Safafa between Bethlehem and Jerusalem. I studied history and tour guiding and I produce a weekly podcast called Stories from Palestine. You can find it on your favorite podcast player or go to the website storiesfrompalestine.info. Welcome to Jerusalem Unplugged, the only podcast dedicated to Jerusalem, its history, and its people. Your host, Roberto Matza, will bring you guests discussing their relationship with the Holy City. A journey through history, society, feelings, and hopes for the future. Follow the podcast on all social media platforms at Jerusalem Unplugged. Welcome to Jerusalem Unplugged, the podcast dedicated to Jerusalem, its history and its people. I'm your host, Roberto Mazza, and today, with great pleasure, my guest is Shaul Adar. Shaul has recently written a book called On the Border, The Rise and Decline of the Most Political Club in the World. Shaul is a journalist, and he wrote a fascinating narrative that brings together both his personal life and experience football or soccer as it is known uh, the other side of the ocean and the history of the club intertwined with the history of Palestine and Israel. So the book is very much about free narratives that always come together and they bring a bit of the personal, something about the club and something about the larger history of Israel-Palestine. Obviously we're going to talk about the history of the club and how it became not just the most political club in the world, but also a club that represents uh, racism, fanaticism, and is often associated with violence. But first of all, Shao, welcome. Hi, Roberto. Thanks for having me. Now, the first question I want to ask is very much uh, about yourself. So if you can tell us a little bit about your background and also about the origins of this book. Yeah, I was born in Beersheba, in the Israeli desert. Uh, Moved around Israel, university in Haifa, a little bit in Jerusalem, worked in Jerusalem for a few years, uh, lived in Tel Aviv, and in 2000 I moved to to England, and um, since then I'm living there in London, and well, until the pandemic, having a wonderful time, uh, seeing lots of football, being a journalist, it's my third book, the other previous two are in Hebrew, both about football. But as a journalist, I write about everything from politics to travel to art. So I try to bring it into my book. And I thought what would be a good subject for a book. And uh, for me, Bitar story is fascinating. But what makes it more poignant is the, the connection to Israeli politics and Israeli-Palestine history. So I thought it would be interesting and... I hope I wasn't wrong. You are not indeed. I mean, the, the history of Beitar Jerusalem goes beyond uh, the history of a football or soccer club. It's, uh, it's much more than that. And in fact, I, I just want to start asking you a few things about uh, the history of football in Palestine. Now, your narrative, for those that are going to read the book, your narrative really goes back and forth from the present to the past and vice versa. And I was just wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about uh, the origins of football in Palestine. Yeah, it, <coughs> like many other places, it was brought by the Brits via a religious school, St. George, if you know it in Jerusalem, other schools in the Middle East. It was also later brought via some Russian pioneers, some historians, things. But it was formalized by the British after World War I, and they brought, they started a league with more organized games. The Turkish had a few more, uh, also contribu- contributed to the history, but and uh, Atatürk played in Jerusalem against some uh, Zionist team. 
but uh, the big leap forward was with the British. They formed a league, a cup uh, run, a, a cup tournament, and uh, many rivalries and hostilities, which all, always bring some something good. They thought that football will help bring the people together and deliver the balls to schools, Arab and uh, Jewish one in Jerusalem and the area, but as we know, it didn't help any peace, but at least they tried. Now, let, let me ask something about uh, Beitars more specifically. Now, in the book, you make a very interesting statement, and you say that the DNA of Jerusalem, and you talk extensively about Jerusalem, the city and its history, and you say that the DNA of a city and of Beitars are shared. What does that mean, really? I think it's the felt of importance, the, the grandeur, and the, unfortunately, the religion. Uh, if you walk in, in Jerusalem, there are some certain points where you feel the earth is shaking beneath you. It's... Everywhere you go, you see history, politics, religions, and tension and hate. And there are some places in the old city that you're five minutes away from the most important uh, religious and political places in the world. Places that one foot wrong can lead to a major conflict as it erupts once in a while. And... Uh, Beitar also is also always on the verge of being political. And it's never just a... It's not like Maccabi Tel Aviv or Hapoel Be'er Sheva, who are a football club and uh, important football clubs or, and important to the fans. With Beitar, you get the feeling that they represent much more in their own eyes and then they... Because of that, they think they're entitled to to much more privilege than any other club, and, and uh, you can see you can say it about Jerusalem. It's this when we talk about the status of Jerusalem in Israeli society and politics, there's always big talks and uh, how important and how central it is. But if you look more deeply. The city is poor, <laughs> extremely poor, run down, getting worse and worse in the last uh, 20 years, getting weaker economically. And it's, it's parallel to the decline of Bitar. So, and uh, still, they, talk, they feel that they are the team of Jerusalem, the holy place and the... Uh, Hence, you can't say anything derogatory about the club. But if you look more carefully, you see that it's shambolic and it's rotten from the inside. We will go back to um, some of the questions that you just uh, mentioned there. But for the listeners, I, I was just wondering if you can tell us a little more about the origins of Beitar Jerusalem, particularly the connection with Beitar as a political organization. Yeah, Beitar was the sport and youth organization of Herut, the, the predecessor of the Likud. We will use Likud just as shorthand. And uh, at the start, it was meant to be a liberal organization with personal rights and equal rights to the Arab and Palestinians in the future society that will rise. And, but pretty fast it turned into a nationalistic movement. And uh, Beta was formed in 1936 in Iran, Nevi'im Street, which is truly a wonderful place to visit if you're in Jerusalem. And had some uh, teething problem in the early years, was closed and reopened. And in the 40s, it suffered from uh, all the way around. The, the more established Hapoel and Maccabi, <laughs> sorry, I'm recovering from COVID. So 
lots of coughings. Uh, the more established uh, political sport organization of Hapoel and Maccabi try to ostracize them and uh, Beitar Tel Aviv, which was a very strong team. So Beitar had to, was out of the center geographically and politically and had to play a lot with and against uh, Arab teams and Armenian teams, Christian teams from Jerusalem, which is quite surprising. And Omer Reynav, with his very fascinating book, wrote about it. Uh, but it was a very tough childhood, especially when in 1947 the British mandate outlawed the Tau movement and they had to play under a different name. But it gave them sense of identity and uh, sort of resentment against the established, more strong clubs and organization, which it's still part of the club, even when they were the strong establishment. It's it's a fascinating conundrum, how which is a bit like the Likud. How can you be the ruling party for so many years and call yourself an underdog? But they managed to do that quite easily. Uh, well, there are conundrums also in terms of uh, ethnic identity, which we will discuss later, uh, sort of a question of... Uh, the Arab identity of uh, many of the uh, Beitar uh, supporters, but also the hate uh, that has been instilled against the uh, Arabs. So th th there's, a, there's also these contradictions that need to be explained later. But I, I wanted to ask you something about uh, Tel Aviv. You already mentioned you know, some of the Tel Aviv clubs. And one of the arguments that you make in the book is that football in Jerusalem developed differently from Tel Aviv. And I was wondering... How and why? Uh, the main reason it because Maccabi Jerusalem folded and stuff, and so there was a place for Beitar to evolve. There was only Hapoel Jerusalem, which enjoyed the <coughs> support of the Stadrut, the working union, but it wasn't as strong as Hapoel Jerusalem. Uh, sorry, Hapoel Tel Aviv. So for Beitar, there was a, a really open niche to develop and forge an identity and, and to become the second club of the city and then the first club. In Tel Aviv, it was much crowded space and much more competitive with Maccabi and Apoel teams. Football in Jerusalem was special in that specter. And also it was, I think, much more political than Tel Aviv. Uh, at some point, Maccabi and Apoel Tel Aviv became uh, more professional, more still hating each other with passion, still with some political connection, but much more as a, you know, as a fun fact. In, in Jerusalem, it's, it's still extremely passionate. If you say Apoel and Maccabi Tel Aviv, they hate each other because they're different teams. But in Jerusalem, they, they will go back to the 40s, to the persecution of the begging the, as a, the leader of the organization and uh, the leader of the Likud. In Tel Aviv, I don't think you'll hear such things. They said, oh, I hate Apoel, I hate Maccabi, that's it. Because that's what we do as football fans. But Jerusalem, it's still extremely political, and they never seem to get away from it, which I think would le lead to the demise in the end. Helped the demise. There's so many reasons. <laughs> That's a fascinating story, and it reminds me, like, everywhere in football, you have these kind of rivalries. So you may be from Manchester and hate Liverpool, but it's not really political. It's about football and in an ingrained idea that they are your enemies. But you're right here, there, there's something different. And that brings me to the next question. In the book, you talk about the period of the early 1950s as one when Israeli football was violent, corrupt, and political. So can you tell us a little bit more about uh, this period of time? It, there was a big tension between the sports organization of Apoel, Maccabi, and Bita. 
So if one team of Hapoel was running to the championship or trying to avoid relegation, all other Hapoel teams will help her, you know, in a sporting manner or non-sporting manner. And the same goes for Maccabi. The national team had a quota of 50-50 for Hapoel and Maccabi. And uh, many results are extremely dubious. We have to take them in a pinch with a pinch or a mountain of salt. The, there were some last games of the season with strange results. And in some cases, the whole season were voided because they didn't have any sporting merits. It was violent. I, I read a lot many times the official history book of Bitar, and there's lots of newspaper clippings there. And I was astonished by it. how how many times there were violent affairs there, and how they mentioned it. Uh, you know, as a fun fact, the rival ke- keeper had the free tooths no- knocked out by the Beitar fans, and it may have uh, had some influence on the result. Something you know. By the way, funny anecdote. So um, there were other violent events and in other grounds, but it seems that the YMCA where Beitar played was uh, probably the worst. And later in the 60s and 70s, there were extremely violent uh, events with Beitar fans that uh, consolidate the notorious image in in three events, two in, in Tel Aviv and one in Petah Tikva, uh, People with uh, machine guns <laughs> run uh, after the the opponent players, and uh, one referee, an immigrant from Russia, was chased by the Beta fans, and they shouted at him, uh, "Go back to Russia! It's pity that Hitler didn't finish the job with you." So it's more than an image; it's it's the history of the club. Beta Jerusalem, you already mentioned that is not the only team in the city. You already mentioned Apoel Jerusalem. And I was wondering if you can uh, just give us a sense of how these derbies, and when we say derbies, for those that are not accustomed to a football jargon, it literally means a game played by two teams uh, belonging to the same city. So how these derbies played out between Apoel Jerusalem and Beitar Jerusalem? Uh it was very hateful and political. Apoel plays in red as a socialist club and Bita play with yellow just because one of the chairmen liked Brazil. Uh, uh, but the, the, and they used a lot of political uh, slogans. Uh, the Bita fans came armed with rage. They felt betrayed by the country, by the political power of labor, and they felt that disrespected as people and as more traditional religious people than the the non the secular Ashkenazi uh, labor hegemony. And they felt that it's everything is harder for them getting jobs getting well paid they're not well connected they seem as outsiders to the any of the histadrut uh, jobs and they came with that fire to the derbies and when they won one they shouted the the histadrut is mourning the the workers union is grieving and had a parade all the way from the YMCA to Strauss Street, if you know Jerusalem, just to celebrate outside the Histadrut headquarters. Uh, Hapoel uh, always brought, which then was the leading team of the city, but had the bad results in the in the derbies. Uh, always brought some uh, local kingpins of the. Uh, Labour Party to encourage and had a stirring talks before the games against those fascists or 
although some of the some of the players and the fans were actually Beitar supporters by heart and had to hide it. Uh, if you look at the papers from that time, the each defeat was greeted with disproportionate uh, uh, reaction. You know, we lost to the horrible uh, sacrilegious labor or how would did we manage to lose our honor in front of those fascists? And uh, some of it is still, if you go to Twitter before this year, last season, there begins, you had some echoes of the past. Although, and um, about a poll, did enjoy the support of the stronger political organization and financial arms of the Eastern route. But there always been some kind of schlemizel, if you know the word. Not really that good. They had a good, and once they sold the home ground in Catamon and had to share the, the ground in at the YMCA, they had a very short brief of success in the early 70s. But since then, the, they've been <clears throat> on steady decline, some truly shocking, horrible football disasters. And just in the last year, they managed to get back to the first division after many years outside it. So, in some way, Hapoel missed their opportunity to become... They had many years where they were the first team, the only team in the first league and Bita were languishing in the second league, but they didn't manage to get the support of most of the people. At best, it was 50-50 or even less, despite being the strongest club. And then it, they, they lost most uh, of the fandom in the city uh, throughout the years. But uh, they managed to recover and now they got some solid fan base. Although in small numbers, but it's quite solid and they got their identity back. With Beitar, it's they still, uh, we will speak about it soon, they're dealing with their own identity problems. Hapoel Jerusalem is a fascinating story too, one of a sort of a collapse and then rebirth. And I, and I enjoyed reading and I remember also the story about how uh, fans basically built it back and eventually managed to bring, uh, you know, sort of a second team of Hapoel back to a, you know, sort of purchasing the title halfway. So it's it's another fascinating story, but I want to focus here on... Uh, be, be Just uh, one word. I use the the story of the new Hapoel Jerusalem as a metaphor for the liberal Ashkenazi Jerusalem that it's been written down in the press so many times that saying all, be, all Jerusalem is now ultra-Orthodox, religious, Mizrahi, Likud, uh, uh, right-wing nutters, and there's no hope for Jerusalem. And although the the, the numbers of uh, the secular community in Jerusalem are declining, never write them down completely. It's st- there's still big university, hospital, civil service. There will always be some very important... Uh, secular base in Jerusalem. And that brings me to sort of a central part of your book, which is like uh, one of the most important uh, aspects of, of your book, the, the question of the Mizrahi Jews. So Beta Jerusalem is deeply connected with this identity, the identity of, uh, in English we may say, Oriental Jews, who in Israeli society have always been discriminated against. I mean, sometimes people forget that uh, Mizrahi Jews coming from uh, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, Egypt, they also, they all had to uh, go through uh, through camps and then they were relocated in the periphery of Israel. Some sort of, uh, you know, like second-class citizens. Uh, obviously, the suspicious was that because they were Arabs, could have turned into a fifth column. So, and obviously here you see the sort of a big divide between Ashkenazi and Mizrahi Jews. And I was wondering, how did the club become associated with Mizrahi Jews? And also, 
How do you see this divide, Ashkenazi, Mizrahi, Jews, uh, influencing uh, Israeli football? Uh, today, it's apart from Bitar, it's not a big issue because most of the players and many of the fans are Mizrahi, so it's there's no clear cut. You know, they, they play together, and the, only only with Beitar it's still an issue and identity. And I think it's mainly down to Menachem Begin. He made the connection, and. Uh, the people mainly from North Africa, Iraq, uh, Iran, they were put in transit camps like the Ashkenazi because the, the new country was tiny and without resources. So everybody were put through, for, through the same process. But the Ashkenazi left much earlier for many reasons and got well connected, got better jobs. And they felt more at home here while under Ben Gurion and his labor, uh, the country was more secular and uh, sometimes you can say it was racist and uh, with very dubious feelings about the Mizrahi Jews. Uh, But if you talk to people or read uh, the main thing was the how religion was seen by the authorities. The, in the early years, the, Israel was much more secular than today, and uh, many of the Mizrahi uh, immigrants felt that they, were, the, they even tried to force them to lose their religion. And that is still a burning issue among them. Uh, and Menachem Begin used that extremely well to bring to bring them into Herut and Likud, and uh, also use the economic and the social discrimin- discrimination against them. Uh, and that, and most of them had more nationalistic feelings than the Ashkenazi, which is. Uh, very fascinating issue, but uh, it's it's been the from the fifties. So they felt at home with the Likud, and they felt that they can't support a Poel team who plays with red, and they got the uh, hammer and sickle on their badge. They felt it's you know abomination. So pl- supporting a team who, who played the, with the menorah badge was much more natural for them. Um, and and the early years, the fifties and the sixties, when they were the second best team and had to fight the the big apoel organization, uh, it meant that the results were poor. But as building identity and camaraderie, it was excellent for Bita, and uh, it meant that the this emotional ties between fans and the club were stronger than many other clubs. This is a fascinating story of how politics, ethnicity, and obviously sport, they all come together. And that brings me to the question of uh, trying to understand when did the reputation of Beitar as a violent club with violent supporters begin? Uh, I think it was... The the key events were 1969, if I remember correctly, the events at Bloomfield against Sapol Tel Aviv, which I mentioned earlier, were <laughs> there was some uh, soldiers on on a day out from the army with a machine gun getting into the pitch and chasing the center forward of Sapol Tel Aviv, who nutmegged them. Uh, and then they burned the, the crossbars and the nets and destroyed the, the stadium, more or less. That was one event. And the second one was in Petah Tikva in 1975 or four. I can't remember. I can look it up. Uh, in a cup tie against Hapoel Petah Tikva, which was also very one of the old guard of Israeli football, very suc- the most successful team in the 60s, Hapoel team. 
uh, and Beitar lost the cup tie and they uh, they trashed the stadium. They chased uh, Apoel Petah Tikva fans to the uh, orange orchids outside the stadium. They sent uh, players and fans to hospital. People were fearing for their lives. And astonishingly, astonishingly the chairman of Beitar, Lazy Rivlin, the brother of the future to be Ruvi Rivlin, the president of Israel, demanded a technical win for Beitar Jerusalem on some ridiculous ground. They never felt the need to be accountable, even when it was clear cut. Uh, there was another event against Apollo Tel Aviv in Bloomfield in '82, and together with small, smaller incidents, it led to the image or perception or the reading the situation that Beitar is the most violent team in Israeli football, and. I don't think they're quite embarrassed by it. If they, they, they want to make home games in Jerusalem as hospitable as possible, there are some, uh, you know, low key events all the time, especially when they play against Sapporo Tel Aviv and the Arab teams. So there is a base to the feeling. It's not just the terrible Tel Aviv Ashkenazi lift lefty media who are after them. It's much more hmm, let look at the history and it's quite obvious. In the book, I would say that uh, in every chapter you can find descriptions of various football games or specific seasons, which also are intertwined with the history of violence. But there's one specific season that caught my eye, and that is 1975-1976, which marked, for the first time, a battle between two Mizrahi teams, so two teams that represented Oriental Jews, Beitar Jerusalem and Beersheba. Now, Beersheba is an interesting club too, is obviously in the periphery of Israel, and perhaps some of the listeners are not familiar with this team, which in the past few years have been rather successful, in fact, they also became uh, uh, very popular throughout Europe when they, a few years ago, uh, they actually uh, beat uh, uh, Inter Milan. So, obviously, that gave the team uh, more notoriety. But I was wondering if you can take us uh, through a little bit this 1975-1976 uh, seasons and why the history of these two teams became intertwined. Yeah, I was a kid living in Beersheba then, going to almost all the home matches, so I remember it quite clearly. The year earlier, Besheva won its first title, and although it's an Hapoel club, it was the team of the periphery, or the team from the desert, non-Tel Aviv club, the first team outside Tel Aviv and Netanya to win the title. And it was a homegrown team, only one player was from outside the Besheva, and it was... Uh, it, it told you that something is happening in Israeli sport and Israeli society. Uh, Beitar in 75 was relegated, but because the, the league was so corrupt, <laughs> all relegations were frozen and they got stay of execution thanks to Ehud Olmert and another member of the Knesset who led the, the demand, which was with a good base. I think it was the right decision. And in 75-76, uh, a young player in name Uri Malmilian came through the ranks of Beitar. He was born just outside the, the old city walls of Jerusalem, then still under Jordanian rule, uh, playing under snipers' attacks once in a while. And he was proper first star of Beitar Jerusalem. He was a humble, very likable guy and outstanding player. And he transformed the, the history of the club from really second-rate club to, to a club who started uh, fighting for titles. And that season, Paul Beersheva looked like 
winning the, another title easily, especially after they won at YMCA. And then they, they stopped something in the last third of the league. Internal squabbling and rifts tore the team apart and they stopped uh, winning games. And Bita closed the gap to only two points in the last uh, game of the season. And Beersheba had an easy home game, which I went to against Maccabi Yafo. Beitar had to play against Maccabi Tel Aviv in Bloomfield. And there was the usual radio program of the day was canceled to keep everything more sport, sport-like. And to our astonishment, Beersheba lost that game 1-0, missed the penalty, and we thought that the title was lost and we wait, waited and waited for the result from Tel Aviv until it came and Beta lost to Maccabi Tel Aviv. So Beersheba won its second title, Beta lost its first real chance of winning the title, but still had the, the cup final against the same Maccabi Tel Aviv four days later in what was became the really major point of history of Beitar. They played in the final in really packed Ramat Gan Stadium and uh, they won it under the stardom of Uri Malmilian and became, I think we can say, a team with a national appeal. They broke out of the Jerusalem boundaries and uh, everyone and then there is the question did it help the Likud win the general election of 1977. Um, I don't know. Begin don't think so. He told Eud Olma that it, it didn't matter. People would have voted for him anyhow. Other political uh, correspondents think it brought this more energy to the Likud. But we, on the symbolic level, yes, it was very important and it, it it did it was a good uh, foreteller of the political fortune of Israel Beitar winning its third title Beersheba becoming a dominant team a team of the periphery and then the Likud winning the the, the election for the first time in 1977 you already mentioned that uh, obviously the Beitar Jerusalem is deeply connected and associated with the Likud party, which, again, for the listeners, we should say is a right-wing party. But I, I was just wondering, how did actually Beitar become the team of the Likud party? Was just the, the agency of uh, Begin and other politicians, or how did it play out this sort of relationship? And also, how did racism and bigotry begin to affect Beitar? Was it connected to the ideology of the Likud party, or it's coming, um, coming in from uh, uh, sort of uh, grassroots associations or society itself. Which also brings me to the, the last part of this long question. Beta Jerusalem is known for uh, this, uh, I would say, uh, let me use the word disgusting because it, it is what it is, the motto forever pure. Can you tell us how that became part of a team too? Yeah, well, it's going to be a long answer. Uh, first of all, Bitar and Likud or Herut was also in always intertwined. If we look at the first Bitar team from 1936, there were people who later became ministers of Bitar playing for Bitar, Chaim Kofu. And throughout the years, players and especially chairmen and activists in the club became a lot of them became ministers, one of them Prime Minister, Eud Olmert, and one of them the President, uh, Ruby Rivlin. So it was always a good place to start a political career, uh, to some degree. I don't think it will help you if you're not a good politician or not a popular it, it wouldn't build you, build you a political career out of the blue. But if you have the, 
those two together, it's a very important force, as <coughs> we've seen throughout the years. Uh, remind me of the middle part of the question. The middle part of the question was very oh, much about the question yeah. of racism and bigotry. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's the, the, you could always sense some hostility, but it became clear and outspoken, and you know, without any guilt or shame in mid nineties. There were two reasons in my eyes. Uh, the Oslo process, which many people f felt threatened by it, the, the way of life, the security and the, <coughs> the future of Israeli settlements in the West Bank. Uh, Israel and mainly Jerusalem suffer horrific terror attacks, which I had the uh, you know, the traumatic uh, memories of hearing those explosions, you know, I don't know, 500 meters from me. So it's a sound you don't forget in a hurry, not even 30 years later. Uh, uh, life in Jerusalem was tough those years. Bus exploded. Parents were worried all the time when their kids left the house. People driving stayed away from buses at traffic lights uh, and tension was rising high between Jews and Arabs, Israelis and Palestine and left and right. Uh, and another reason was the, the rise of uh, Arab-Israeli football. Suddenly there were more and more uh, Arab-Israeli footballers, you know, Arab citizens of Israel. They were playing in the national team. There were Arab teams from Arab towns and cities playing in the second and first league in bigger and bigger numbers. And so now the racist fans of Beitar, not all of them, let's, I'm always making this point, not all, all, all Beitar fans, but very big proportion, more than any other club, had someone to hate in arm length that could shout those racist songs and chants. It wasn't something obscure. And, and the key point that other clubs, with the rise of the Arab-Israeli football, recruited the players. If you look at Maccabi Haifa, which was the strongest team of that era, era or recent teams of Apoel Be'er Sheva, they got very strong base of Arab players. They're now the 20% of the players in the top division. And in sporting manners, you're harming yourself if you exclude those players playing for your team. And you can't... I don't think... The, there are many nationalist Beita, uh, Likud and uh, other parties who support all the clubs in Israel. But once the, the team playing with three Arab players, I don't think they, they, they will feel <coughs> at ease to chat, to sing those songs. With Beitar, it became a raison d'etre for many fans, for many organizations. And it's then it's a dynamic. Many of the normal fans who just want to see football got away and away from the team, disgusted and felt that they can't support it anymore. And more and more people who like the, those racist tones much more than football become attracted to the club. So everything become accelerated more and more racist fans and less and less normative fans. And it all came to a head in 2013 <coughs> in the notorious Chechen affair when the club had signed two Chechen Muslim players for dubious reasons. <laughs> uh, and 
big chunks of the of the fans refused to accept it and fought it till the end until they got chased away and the symbolic part was during the first game after the signing of those players uh, a banner was raised in in the stadium saying Beitar forever pure and there's no way of hiding it it's a Nazi overtone it's a racist you know talking about racial purity you can't hide it or avoid it and it since then Beitar is struggling from that sim- specific moment they suffer economically sponsors left the club at that moment <laughs> one sponsor signed the deal a week earlier and once the that sign was raised he left the stadium and at the parking lot told the uh, the marketing director that the deal is off and since then the club is toxic is stained and some of the chairman and the owners try to fight it and it cost them dearly and the main point is those fans of La Familia organization had the door open for them by a previous owner which was very tempting things to do they supported the club they you know brought uh, color and supported the owner but once things went uh, the downhill you can't uh, turn the turn it back they part of the club and uh, it's like getting rid of a cancer you need a very uh, agonizing period of therapy and until it happens the club is suffering we will talk about la familia just in a couple of minutes as we reach the end of the uh, interview but i want to ask you something about the question of uh, Arab football in Israel. You mentioned earlier about 20% of the population in Israel is Palestinian descent. And um, as you mentioned earlier, in the past few years, they have become more prominent in Israeli football. And not just as uh, single players, but also as clubs. And one of them, Sakne, became a winner. Um, but also uh, it, it, it sort of brought... Uh, you know, more clashes, particularly between Beitar and, and Sakne. And I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about the club, the Sakne, and also how their clashes with Beitar developed. Yeah, they, they rose in the early 2000s. Uh, they weren't the first club, the first Arab club in the the first league, in the first division, but they were the most successful. Other clubs went up and down and some of them really disappeared. But with Sakhnin, they here for over 20 years. They got relegated twice and bounced back immediately, which shows you that they, got, they are part of the first division. And they won the cup uh, in 2003 or 2004, which was an historic event in Israeli football. Uh, the Beitar fans organization turned the website black for the day in to show the the grieving but Israeli football in general welcomed them you can say there's a bit of sport washing element uh, but in general it's positive Israeli football is one of the most uh, welcoming and opens first in Israeli society. It's based on a merit. If you're good enough, you'll play in the top teams and the national team. So there were some cases, there were five players in the national team. And uh, some some people did not like it, but for most people, it, it's fine. There's no problem with it. And Sakhnin is becoming more and more nationalistic by themselves you got a feeling that they do enjoy the those clashes with Beitar. it's good for their image it's good for the business it's good for identity it's good for bringing the fans together 
and uh, you hear more and more nationalistic chants about Al-Aqsa, about Jerusalem, about you can see Palestinian flags in which you couldn't believe it 20 years ago. Uh, and the, the, they're not the good Arabs. They enjoy the provocation. So it's going to be interesting in the coming years. And they're trying to, they can't, they don't have the financial muscles of Maccabi Haifa and Apol Beersheba and Maccabi Tel Aviv. But they do try to bring the best Arab players to the team. So it will be interesting. Uh, and it's, they do enjoy the demise of Bitar. <laughs> you can see it on the social networks. Uh, and uh, there is a little anecdote about how many Arab players scored against Beitar and then took the Muslims' bow, which enraged the Beitar fans even more. And it, it became part of the Israeli football uh, mythology that most Arab players will eventually score against Beitar. <clears throat> Let's go back to La Familia. You mentioned uh, this group, and I was wondering if you can tell us what it is, La Familia. What is this organization, and why are so uh, popular in a sense, and how comes they are so powerful? They started as a as a, a group of fans in the early two thousand, and then with the help of social media and the internet, it, everything was much easier to form and liquidize uh, to establish and they did enjoy the the, the, sec the last period of success in Bitar in 2007 under Arkadi Gaidamak who opened the doors for them and but then came Gaidamak left the team to hang out and dry cut his financial support of the team and but Vita stayed with this burden of La Familia and then they be, they become much more about the politics and the Arab hatred than the football uh, they see themselves as a political organization these days you can see them in a demonstrations supporting Netanyahu or during clashes and riots or nationalistic events in Jerusalem. They are there with the black and yellow outfits, not and quite proud to be La Familia, the political branch. And they are in big numbers and they are violent and they during the the internal conflict of the Chechen years in 2013, they kicked out anybody of the Eastern uh, stand in the Teddy who wasn't one of them, who was too open-minded, who dared to support the team. And the clashes, this civil war is ongoing now for nine years. That, Sometimes it's more obvious, sometimes it's more uh, relaxed. But even in last year, Beta signed a, mo a Muslim player, which was a big step forward. And it, it was accepted by most fans for the first time. The, it wasn't repeat of the Chechen shame. And uh, some fans choose to support the team and that specific players. <clears throat> and uh, La Familia attacked them physically. Uh, it led to... It did help the, the normative fans to uh, get together and, and, you know, voice a resentment against La Familia. They're calling them cancer in social media openly which they were afraid to do a few years ago they reject them in in the stand but they got big numbers and big support and it's like uh, toothpaste 
you can push it out of the tube, but it's extremely hard to push it back. And uh, once the racist feels at home, they're not going to live off their own accord. You got to do something. And uh, there is a constant battle against them. That's why I'm, I wrote in the book that Beitar is not a racist organization. <clears throat> but it's under racist influence. Of course, it can change if new owner comes and stop the fight against them. But at the moment, many fans try to resist it. But at the moment, it doesn't. It looks ha- like hard work. I don't want to say it's impossible, but until Beitar will change something basic, which is to become a normal club with Arab players. I don't see them living away. And that would be the best way to make them live and form their own hideous, little, nasty, racist, forever pure Jerusalem club. And hopefully, but it's, I'm not sure that this, that day is close. Now, throughout the book, you talk about uh, the various owners of the club. One actually is a very sort of a funny, but also dramatic story of this guy, Guma Aguyar. Uh, but but th- that's, uh, th- that's one, uh, one story. Now, like many other clubs, obviously, Beitar changed hands several times. And I was wondering, how did money change the club and its perception? And also, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, the uh, 2020 field uh, takeover by an Arab a very shady individual from the Emirates. Betar is a sick organization with very low natural defense. So it attracts weirdos, dubious characters, some, in some cases, some sadly people who are not that stable, like Gumag Yorut, who had all the best intention and was a charming personality, but suffered from serious episodes of mental health, which Jerusalem exacerbated. Jerusalem and Beta, living in Jerusalem, going back to the, your question about the DNA, makes everything more political, more dramatic, more uh, emotional and more important. And people think that they're not just the owners of a football club, the owner of Jewish pride and uh, importance. So that make everything more radical. Uh, going back, so Betar attracted lots of owners who came as a messiah and turned out to be false messiah quite uh, rapidly. The, I, I've made a few times a list of the most bizarre and most eccentric owners and the list just getting longer and longer. In the last year, there were three of them. And one of them was the the royal from the UAE uh, who was supposed to buy 50% of the shares of the club. And, and it led to major demonstration for and against the move in Jerusalem. And it turned out it was... There was nothing behind it. It was a front for something we don't know. It that guy didn't have enough money. His capital was in in the state bonds of Venezuela, who you can guess not worth a lot. He didn't have enough money. Everything was extremely shady, and it fell apart after a week of publications. the The media did an excellent job of exposing it, and the Israeli FA didn't let the, this shady deal go through. Uh, and now Betar is stuck. I don't... We can't, It's another crucial week this week for them. They need to find a new owner, and the rumors are rife, and I can't quote them without a lawyer sitting next to me. But going over the Betar feed on Twitter, you don't see a lot of happy faces it's either they will get relegated this week by the FA or they got new owners that 
most of the fans don't trust and don't like and don't feel that his interests are in saving Britain. They hinting quite a <laughs> worrying hints, let's say. And we'll, we'll see in a few months' time or uh, a few years' time. It, it looks like that years of neglect, racism, and dubious honors are costing Beitar quite heavily, and now they're paying the price. It's, it's really hard to see them forming any team close enough to the big three of Israeli football. And uh, But, yeah, we'll have to wait for a few days. You just served me the perfect assist using uh, football jargon for the last question. So, where is Beitar directed in contemporary Jerusalem? It's, it's a great question, actually. Beitar is less and less a Jerusalem club, which is another reason why it's suffering a lot. It's as Jerusalem becoming more orthodox, religious, ultra orthodox city and poor city, the numbers of people who buy season ticket or tickets or going to Beitar games is getting less and less. So they got more fans outside Jerusalem. And as you know, traffic in Israel is is ongoing disaster. <laughs> especially <laughs> to Jerusalem. There's no train service for... And the, and the club refused to play on Saturdays, on the Shabbat. So they want to have all the... all the cakes and still... Uh, eat all the cakes and still have it. To be a, a Shabbat uh, observing club in a city without uh, enough uh, fans and to still... Uh, have a big uh, support uh, base. Uh, so, and it doesn't happen. The numbers of people going and paying for Bitar is are miserable compared to Maccabi Tel Aviv and Maccabi Haifa. So economically, the club is uh, suffering uh, in the most, you know, important and basic way. And uh, the racism attracts not just the football fans, it attracts the, the political fans who want to shout death to the Arabs. So everything on list is, you know, they need to find a way to reverse the history, to become a clean club with much bigger fan base, and to, to become a club that it's nice to, to go there and watch a game. For many Israelis, football is an, an escape from the horrible politics and the daily tension of the Israeli-Palestine conflict. So you can go to Beersheba, see the team win three titles in a row, two cups, and enjoy yourself. But if you go to Beitar, you're reminded about the conflict all the time. So it's not fun. So they need to do that. They need to attract more of the secular population of Jerusalem, which now they have a fight on their hands against a poor Jerusalem and against the splinter club of Nordia Jerusalem, who wants to have a open-minded liberal Beitar team like the old... Chirut uh, base. So it's getting harder and harder. And I was attacked for saying that obvious thing, but it's time for them to look at reality, stop playing the victim, <laughs> and read the map. I don't know if they'll do that because it's much easier to play the victim, but it's their problem, not mine. This was uh, Shaul Ada author of On the Border, The Rise and Decline of the Most Political Club in the World, published by Pitch Publishing in 2022. Shaul, thank you so much. Thank you, Roberto. It's been a pleasure. 
Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to support the podcast, please share it with others on social media or leave a rating and review. To catch all the latest, follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Jerusalem Unplugged. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.